Thomas Harvey from the Art City Defenders. Uh, the Art City Defenders in November published a, a very informative and helpful white paper on this topic and have been leaders for a number of years, uh, alums of the St. Louis University School of Law on whose campus we uh, are meeting tonight. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Thomas. Please proceed. Sure. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, about a month ago, a reporter asked me why people were just now finding out about what's going on in the municipal courts. And my answer to that reporter is reflected in what I heard in the comments earlier and in the breakout sections is, it depends on what you mean by people. Um, the people who are poor in this region and who are African American in this region know exactly what's going on in these courts. And they've known for 50 years. And the only people who don't know what's going on are the people who aren't in this room right now. And I would, I would call attention to the fact that besides Judge Vaderot, who I saw in the room earlier, um, I don't see anybody from the municipal court system here tonight. I don't see a single prosecutor or judge. I don't see anybody here on the night to discuss municipal courts at all. So in spite of the fact that people are contacting the commissioners and saying they're taking this seriously, um, I think it speaks volumes that they're not here in the room right now. Um, to Judge Vaderat's credit, we don't agree, I don't agree with everything that his proposals of his committee, but he takes the issue seriously. He's been spending a lot of time on it, and he's making some serious proposals. And I would, uh, before I go on to what I was really going to talk about, um, I would hope that the rest of the lawyers and judges and prosecutors in this region who are making money off the backs of poor people in this region would show up and uh, take this seriously as well. So, what, what our clients have been telling us for five years, our clients are primarily the homeless in the region and the working poor, and if you ask them how municipal courts work, they say a couple of things. One thing is they make people poor and they keep people poor and they prevent people from exiting poverty when they try it. Um, our, our work, again, is with the homeless, and, and when we began, we were brand new lawyers. My co-founder, Michael John Voss, and John McCanner and I went to St. Patrick's Center, which if you don't know it, it's a great organization, does great work in the city of St. Louis help, helping the homeless. And the only reason, you might ask yourself, why do the homeless need lawyers? Well, it's because the, the primary obstacle preventing homeless people from getting off the streets and into housing and jobs and treatments were warrants for their arrest. A warrant for their arrest in a municipal court for being poor. A warrant for their arrest in a municipal court for being unable to pay fines that were assessed that were too high to begin with. Um, the city of St. Louis spends ten million dollars a year to prevent and end homelessness. That money goes to social service agencies in order to provide housing and jobs and treatment to the most vulnerable in our society. That money can't be spent effectively because of the existence of the municipal court system. Right. That money cannot help people get off the streets, help the most vulnerable among us, among us, and save our region money because of the existence of the municipal court system. Um, so there are, there are stories that we've heard in the last five years that I know most of the folks in this room have uh, been familiar with it for the benefit of those who are listening to this or watching this, I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, clients have told us that they've been denied access to courts, and that I heard that earlier in the room. For years, we heard people talking about how uh, mothers would go to court with their children, and they would be told that mom could come in, but the kids couldn't, because the kids weren't on the docket that night. And so you've got a poor person who's come to court to pay their fines and fees, make, they're on a payment docket, to come to court to make their payment, and they're denied access to the court. So that creates a, a tough choice for mom. She can go into court and leave her children on the parking lot or not go into court and get a warrant issued for her arrest. And what we'd been hearing for years was that person who had been made the decision to go into court and pay their fines to avoid the arrest and who was arrested on the courthouse steps for child endangerment. And that's, that happens... Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it doesn't, happen to happen, doesn't have to happen very often for people to say, I'm not going to court on my night if I can't get child care and run the risk that I'm either going to get a warrant for my arrest or I'm going to get arrested when I go in to make a payment. Um, the other thing that I'll highlight real quickly because I know our time has been condensed is 
four people who have been arrested on a warrant for the inability to pay their fines. They've been, to be, to be frank, what they've been arrested on is not showing up in court. But they didn't show up in court sometimes because of the decision I just laid out. Sometimes they didn't have the money to pay and they were afraid they were going to be arrested. And they have legitimate reason to fear they're going to be arrested. They're threatened routinely with arrest on the payment docket. There are some courts where they are taken from the courthouse to a, what they call the dungeon below the court and held in a room that is not fit for human, human inhabitants and held there and extorted until they make a payment. That's not one person that told us. That's, that's 10 people that told us. There's an article written in your paper in St. Louis Post-Dispatch who told you that, and it's just ignored. Um, but folks say that they've been brought in on a warrant for failing to appear, and when they're brought before the judge, they say, Judge, I don't have the money. I'm homeless. I'm poor. And the judge says, I don't care. Go out in the hall, get on that pay phone, call everybody you know, and try to get some money. And you, might, and you might be able to go home tonight. And that's illegal. It's unconstitutional. We ought to be ashamed it's going on in our backyard. So our, our paper that we issued was just a, an attempt to take seriously what our clients told us, which was that they were being profiled, they were being racially profiled, um, and that they were being exploited because they were poor. And when you put those two things together, Nobody was listening to what they were saying. Um, when we dug into the numbers, they said for years, this isn't about public safety, this is about the money. When you start looking at the budgets of these towns and how much money they make off these courts, it's hard to, it's hard to refute that. When you've got the second highest source of revenue in many of these towns being gen revenue generated from municipal courts, and it's $2.7 million in one town, and it's $3.1 million in another town, it's hard, to, it's hard to say, no, it's not about the money. And I know from my, my private practice, I've got a client right now who's facing charges in an unnamed municipality who's charged with possession of marijuana and possession of drug paraphernalia. And for the low, low price of $1,000, he can turn that into a, park, a littering ticket. This is a system that works for, poor, for rich people and doesn't work for poor people. And it doesn't work for black people in our region. And it works for lawyers and judges and prosecutors here who make their living off of it. Um, and I would, and as far as solutions, because I know we're supposed to be talking about solutions, I support Senator Schmidt's um, proposed legislation that would cap revenue at 10%. I think that's a great start. I would, uh, I would also support the consolidation or uh, abolition of these municipal courts. It's not necessary. <laughs> we don't have to have a municipal court system. We don't have to have a court in your backyard to enforce your municipal court ordinances. They could be enforced in St. Louis County in the Associate Circuit Court level. Now that will take some doing, but they could be enforced there. Um, the other thing is, people, they've, we should be humiliated into doing something about this because Montgomery, Alabama was just sued for operating a debtor's prison, much like the ones that are operating in our county, and they figured out how to do something about it. Now it took being shamed and being sued and the threat of federal intervention, uh, hopefully we don't have to go that far. But the answer there was uh, Alec Karakatsana said equal justice under law was able to get a settlement that included a provision of attorneys for everyone. Um, everyone who's facing charges where they might be jailed. And make no, make no mistake, if you're standing in municipal court and you don't have the money to pay, you might end up in jail one day. So uh, lawyers for everybody. And they did as a very simple thing. They created a form. Everybody had access to the form. You simply state how much income you have, and they proportion the fines to your income. Yeah. It's a very simple thing. Um, and people then, they were assessed a fine for their infractions, and they were allowed to make small payments, as low as $10 a month. Um, that's, it's, you're not allowed to make $10 a month payments anywhere I know of in St. Louis County. Um, and the other alternative is community service, but it would take some, some work to provide community service in a way that would actually benefit the community. I'm not talking about lining the pockets of a private probation company. I'm talking about someone trying to find a way to make probation, to make community service help the people who need the help the most. Um, thank you very much for your time.
Thomas, the uh, court reporter, is trying to transcribe all that applause <laughs> for you here tonight. Thank you for the selfless work of you and the Arch City Defenders, and I know you have a number of volunteers who, who help you um, in, in, in your good work. Uh, next, we'd like to hear from Professor May Quinn uh, from Washington University, who's done particular work on the impact of this system on youth and juveniles, and that's why we've asked her to be with us here tonight. Professor Quinn, thank you. Thanks very much. Tough act to follow. Uh, I also do not have a PowerPoint, so hopefully uh, my voice carries and these stories carry. Um, I also had 20 minutes worth of information that I've condensed to 15, 12, 6, and we'll see how this goes. So I'll just cut to the chase. I've been a lawyer for 20 years. I've practiced across the country. I'm not just an ivory tower kind of academic. Uh, I have represented poor clients all over this nation, from Bronx, New York, to Austin, Texas, to Knoxville, Tennessee, to Washington, D.C., and I have never seen what I see here in this town. From widespread due process violations to deprivations of the right to counsel to hostility and retaliation for just doing our jobs as lawyers, to unequal and inhumane practices that work to reduce the life chances of St. Louis area youth, when I set up my legal clinic at Washington University six years ago and I took my students into our courts and communities, I could not believe what I saw. I was shocked, shocked. And we have practiced in the juvenile courts, in the municipal courts, in the appellate courts, in the school disciplinary proceedings, in administrative proceedings. So it's not just a single view and it's not just on a single night and it's not just for one single client that I'm talking about. So while my testimony today will focus on municipal policing and prosecution of minors, people under the age of 18, I hope that the commission comes back to the many issues facing young people in our schools, our juvenile justice system, and our criminal justice system. And I hope you will hear from my good and great colleagues at the SLU Legal Clinic as well, given their much longer view on these issues as they've been working on them uh, long before I was here in town and because I believe we need wholesale, comprehensive, constitutionally rooted changes concerned with inspiring confidence and delivering fairness for all in our systems of justice, not just piecemeal fixes or band-aids. So let me tell you a story. About three weeks ago, I received a call from a mom. This is a formerly homeless woman struggling to, with her own health issues and trying to keep a roof over her head for her kids. And uh, we have been working with this mom and her kids for quite a while. She was upset because she didn't know where her youngest son was. She learned he'd been picked up by police while walking down the street. They stopped him in a public setting, put him in cuffs, placed him in the back of the squad car, took him to a jail somewhere, and left his young girlfriend crying on the sidewalk. She wasn't sure where he was now, 10 hours later, and he's only 17. When I finally tracked the, kid, the child down, uh, my suspicions were confirmed because I'd asked mom, you know, does he have an outstanding warrant? She said she didn't know about any, but when she spoke to one of the officers, he'd mentioned something like that. But as I probed further, I got a sense that this was really something different and something that we deal with all the time. It's not a warrant, it's a different kind of W W that the officers put in the system, and that is a wanted for questioning that is used that is used as a widespread practice to pick up children in this community and take them into custody with no charge, no warrant, and no probable cause. I have begun calling these St. Louis County's catch and release practices because these children are picked up and held for up to 24 hours and then just released back to the community, puzzled and feeling quite disrespected and having great disrespect for our systems of justice. So I tracked this kiddo down and I found out by that time um, that he was in a particular jail because sometimes you might be arrested by one police uh, uh, officer from one municipality but taken to a municipal jail in another municipality. Some evenings we spend our time trying to track these kids down from place to place to place. But I tracked this kiddo down, now in custody for 14 hours, and I said, why is he being held? You need to release him. This is unconstitutional. And I was told then, as I've been told repeatedly, and my students have been told from the, the low-level line officers all the way up the chain of command, that this is okay in St. Louis. We have a 24-hour rule. 
and after further cajoling, I finally got him out, but that was only after they decided to put him under a recording and then, 14 hours later, give him his Miranda rights. In the, in the two years I've known this child, this is the third time that this has happened to him, and in the six years I've been practicing here, I can't begin to tell you the number of times that this has happened to my clients. As I wrote in the Huffington Post four months ago, this is the due process that kids of color get in St. Louis County, and it's quite different from the due process that Darren Wilson got and they see on TV. Yeah. This is what causes distrust, disrespect, disengagement with our systems. And these practices are twice unconstitutional and unlawful because these children are frequently mixed in the jail cells and the holding tanks with grown adults. And why does this happen? Two reasons. In Missouri, all young people, age 17 and up, or at age 17, you're considered an adult for, for purposes of prosecution. So while 42 states in this country have adopted the constitutional standard of childhood set forth by the Supreme Court in a series of cases, Missouri remains an outlier and children at the age of 17 are automatically considered adults and become invisible for juvenile justice system practices, reporting, and data purposes. It's an invisible population that nobody in the state has really talked about. The second reason this happens is because our juvenile code provides that children as young as 15 may be prosecuted in our municipal courts. When I got to town, it was 15 and a half. Somehow I turned away, I turned back, it was 15. And these children uh, are not processed through the juvenile court system where we can talk about the juvenile court system and the issues that need to be addressed there, but at least in theory, it's kid-friendly and intended to be supportive and therapeutic. Instead, these kiddie traffic violators are processed as if they're adults in the municipal court system and placed in jails in, I believe, a fashion that violates federal law. The Prison Rape Elimination Act says that children need to be separated by sight and sound from adult offenders in our jails and prisons. When my students and I have raised this with local police and jailers and others, they've looked at us and said, Federal law only applies in federal cases. They clearly have no idea what is required of them. I know my time is limited. Let me focus on prosecution at this point. Whether you're a child or an adult, I don't understand why anyone is being arrested in our municipalities for municipal violations. Our courts of appeals and Supreme Court have repeatedly said that municipal courts are civil venues. They are civil proceedings. They have civil processes. In the United States of America, you do not go to jail for a civil infraction. You should not. And so, all of these practices relating to arrest and bail and jail, I find to be fundamentally inconsistent with the Constitution if those are civil courts. And I'm not the first to say this, or at least to suggest it, because 50 years ago, a law professor by the name of T.E. Lauer wrote this very same thing, or suggested the same problem, in a law review article in the Missouri Law Review. And yet we're dealing with the same problems. This question of wanting it both ways, or the problem of wanting it both ways. Wanting it civil for purposes of informality, due process deprivations, and deprivations of the right to counsel but criminal for purposes of punitive practices and putting people in jails coercively to get money out of them. Right. Now the thing Professor Lauer did not talk about and that many people don't talk about is that this isn't just practiced on adults, it's practiced on children. So I'll just briefly touch on two cases we've had recently. Um, we were called about a 17-year-old who uh, was very concerned, he's in foster care, and he had pled guilty to hitting his brother, another teen. I used to do that a lot when I was a teen. I surely spent no time in jail, but this kiddo spent a week in one of our fine municipal jails. And then he was taken before a judge and told if he pled guilty, now there's some contest about what exactly was said, but the bottom line was this child at the age of 17 believed that if he pled guilty, he would get to go home and only have to pay several hundred dollars fine. The problem was he had no lawyer, no parent, was 17, and was severely mentally ill. In fact, left that courthouse and shortly thereafter wound up in an institution and then in foster care. 
We were ultimately able to file a motion and get his plea set aside and the fine forgiven, but guess what? They still made him pay the court costs. And we were chastised for referring to him as a juvenile. We represented a 17-year-old pregnant teen who was prosecuted in one of our other munis for shoplifting a maternity bra and some baby's clothes. She too spent a night in jail with no care for her, pregnant, uh, her, her uh, pregnancy and uh, came to us because she was concerned she was going to be thrown in jail because of her fines. We were not able to get that case entirely thrown out, but we worked it out such that she did not have to pay the fine. And so most kids are not so lucky because there are no assigned public defenders in these courts. Kids take these pleas to av avoid um, what they think is a more harsh consequence, but it's just delaying the ultimate, which is often warrants being dropped because they can't pay these amounts or because they, they get scared and don't show up. And many times they're being prosecuted, fined, and warranted for ordinary adolescent behaviors. So the municipal codes were referenced, and so we have not only you know, a federal body of law and a state body of law, but we have 90 different bodies of law in this town that we're expecting not just adults but children to know and abide by. The problem with these codes is that they're drafted by non-lawyers and are hugely, if reviewed, unconstitutional. They criminalize all manner of ordinary behavior, including ordinary behaviors of children, and they're policed in, particularly in communities of color. Many of these provisions were drafted at a, his, at a historical time and in a historical era that they carry all manner of baggage. And I can assure you I've never represented a child in Clayton, Ledoux, or Chesterfield on, on an affray, but I've done it across the Del Mar Divide in those communities where those kids are the least likely to be able to post bail and the least likely to be able to pay court costs and fees. So I have 10 suggested steps and solutions, but I think I've already gone over my time, so maybe I will wait until the Q&A unless I'm... Oh, okay then. Is that okay with the commission? All right. So there's lots that we can all say, and there's so many uh, good folks bringing so many good ideas to the table. And I'm so, as, as negative as I sound, I do believe this is a moment of opportunity for us. So number one, I think we need to clarify the role of municipal courts as civil venues where fines only may be imposed, and then collection through civil collection mechanisms, like in Knoxville, Tennessee, instead of public shamings and liberty deprivations that take place now. And this is a suggestion that the SLU Legal Clinic, I think, has also uh, put forward and in the press. Second, if this is not done, then munis can't have it both ways. They have to have proper public defender systems. They have to provide due process protections. They have to make sure they are abided by the law. Three, we need to review and revise our home rule statutory scheme for municipal corporations. It's currently a morass. I have no idea what they say. I, I can't figure out, you know, what's a first class municipality or a second class municipality and who's supposed to do what. And someone needs to take a fine tooth comb to that legislation and uh, really create a system if we are going to have a municipal scheme that makes some sense. Fourth, we have to revisit the juvenile codes, jurisdictional provisions, and send kids to juvenile court for treatment, not to serve as cash cows for their communities. We've got to fix the juvenile courts, which, as we know, are currently under their own review. Uh, so I'm not saying they're perfect, but they do operate with a view of children in mind. Five, we need to redefine kids constitutionally to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to 18. There will be a bill introduced this year. As I understand, it's going to be introduced by Senator Wayne Wallingford, a Republican who's part of the Juvenile Justice Task Force that's been looking at this issue. Six, police practices need, I'm not lobbying, by the way, I'm not a lobbyist. I'm just giving educational points. <laughs> <laughs> Police practices, number six, need to be improved and regularly monitored, not just to ensure cultural awareness and uh, reducing racial bias, but age-appropriate practices so that these officers stop traumatizing our children. Yeah. And they need to be further trained on truly updated understandings of constitutional law relating to where people, can, when and where they can be stopped, arrested, and the use of force and deadly force. Seven, uh, remaining municipalities after consolidation need to cull their codes and redraft, get rid of these unconstitutional provisions, and 
get rid of these uh, provisions that criminalize ordinary adolescent behaviors in communities of color. Number eight, it takes not just a muni, but a village. So I'd urge this commission to call for all community stakeholders to be mindful of the needs of kids in this community and step up and step out and offer what they can, including my own employer, Washington University, which can be doing a lot more along these lines. Nine, municipalities, and I, I pick up Thomas's point here, if the judges and the folks at the municipal courts care so much, they can grant amnesty right now for all outstanding warrants, <laughs> fines, and fees. Start anew, make amends, start fresh, and especially do it for the kids whose constitutional rights have clearly been violated in those courts. Seven, going, uh, ten, sorry. Going forward, greater transparency, accountability, and oversight by independent watchdogs. We have no watchdogs in this state. I've never seen anything like it. I don't know how it got like this. And to, we have to do this to encourage respect and, and confidence in the systems of justice. An immediate step could be many have called for an independent prosecutor uh, to review the current um, situation as to Darren Wilson and, and perhaps create uh, a special prosecutor in all circumstances going forward to make sure that there is independent accountability. I was supposed to be on public radio today. I could not because of client matters and dealing with some legislative things, and that's what I was going to talk about. But many believe that that is the appropriate next step currently, and, and it is still possible legally. But I know that's another night's conversation, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Quinn. Thank you for your eloquence. Thank you for your suggestions and your thoughtfulness um, in both representing uh, those before the courts as well as being uh, thoughtful with us and uh, engaging in the legislative process. You don't have to be a lobbyist to talk to us about it. Um, we would like to now hear from um, uh, David Leipholz, who has done a lot of work with the data. There have been a number of questions in the groups about the revenues that these municipalities are getting from uh, these sources. And so uh, we wanted this data to get before the commission briefly and for you to see it. And then we're going to have the entire panel back, uh, Thomas and May and David, uh, for questions. And I know the commission has a number of them. I have a number that I picked up from the groups. And so we will, we will have questions there. So David, please proceed. All right. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak here tonight. I want to first just start off by saying, you know, Thomas, the SLU Law Clinics, a lot of people practicing in this field were the people that we talked to when we first started this study. And I can tell you that when you hear these stories at first, it's very difficult to imagine um, it being the case across an entire system. But what our study found was that is in fact the case. Um, so our key findings, and these are just large, broad swaths of, of our findings, and there's many ripples that will kind of dive into while being respectful of the time. Um, we found a lack of oversight of municipal courts. Um, you know, we touched on, reliant on reliance on revenue fines and fees, procedural issues have been discussed, and then the loss of trust I think is evident. Um, when I say lack of oversight, we really tried to see how this happened. What is different about St. Louis as a region that our municipal court system um, operates in a way that from our initial interviews seemingly had lost the trust of the people. Uh, what we found was that in Missouri there are 45 judicial circuits. Um, and this is a little dry, but I assure you there's, there's a point to it. Uh, the municipal courts in Missouri are a division of the state circuit in which they sit. So if you're in the 21st circuit and you're a municipal court, that presiding judge in that circuit oversees those municipal courts. Um, the problem with the system is that in many ways, it's built to reflect a really fragmented region like we have. Um, on average, the Missouri Judicial Circuit has 8.6 municipal courts. In St. Louis County, there's 81. So, and just to give you a feel for that, um, it's not as if there's a lot of metropolitan areas with a lot of municipal courts and then very few in out-of-state or anything like that. The next closest um, in size has 20 municipal courts. So we have 61 more courts. Where that becomes an issue is you have the same one presiding judge 
that is responsible for overseeing nearly 10 times the municipal courts. And what you have there is a system that lacks oversight and is ripe for many different interpretations of how a municipal court should act and what they're allowed to do. To give you an overall figure for the end product of that lack of oversight, as you can see, the St. Louis region is responsible for bringing in 46% of all municipal fines and fees that are taken in, in the state of Missouri, while only having 22% of the population. If you look at St. Louis County and St. Louis City, uh, they both relatively mirror their percentage of state population. But when you look in the municipal courts within St. Louis County, you see that it's 11% of the population and over a third of the fines and fees, $45 million every year come in uh, through those courts. That led us to really dig a little bit deeper. Um, and what we found was that this is a pretty targeted problem as well. Um, to understand those figures, you have to understand that there are also municipalities that maybe get 1% or 2% of their revenue from court fines and fees. So you can imagine what that means on the other end. It means courts that are bringing in 50, 60% of the operating budget for their municipality through fines and fees. And essentially what develops is an economically incentivized system um, for officers and their community to have negative interactions that drastically and disproportionately impact the people that live there. Um, St. Louis County has 14 municipalities where fines and fees are the single largest source of operating revenue. Um, larger than sales tax revenue, larger than property tax revenue. 13 of the 14 of those municipalities are north of Olive and within the uh, 270 corridor. St. Louis County also has 21 municipalities that collect over 20% of their general revenue from fines and fees. 20 of those 21 lie in that same area, north of Olive and within 270. When we brought this to people's attention, their comment was there should be a law against this. Well, <laughs> there is. The only issue is that while there are seven municipalities we found are over the 30% cap, nothing has been done, even though that revenue is supposed to be going to the school system. Um, we called the state and we asked how come nothing was really being done to monitor this, and we were told that they rely on municipalities to self-report and send the excess <laughs> funds to them. Now, the law itself says that failure to report results in a loss of court jurisdiction. We haven't found any indication that that's been done either. And when we did some basic arithmetic, we also found that if every municipality, the city and the county, all lived up to this 30% cap, we could actually more than double the money we currently take in um, at $45 million. So because of the municipalities that are living below that, um, we're actually a lot lower than we could be. So as you've heard, um, both in the small group discussions um, and from previous speakers, there are some procedural issues. Uh, municipal courts hold individuals unable to pay until they are able to do so. We've heard that um, many stories. As our work not only looked at statistics, but we interviewed hundreds of people who were either in the system, you know, worked in the system, or had experience with it. Um, most courts do not take into account an individual's ability to pay, as you've heard. Um, you know, one of the things that is an issue with that is that when you have 600 people in one court session, it's very difficult to even get through that in one night court session, let alone take into account the, each person as an individual um, and their circumstances. Courts are permitted to create payment plans, reduce fines, or treat fines and fees as a civil matter, but most do not. Um, we found that the most common answer for that was it was just not feasible to pursue it in another way. Um, the easiest way to collect was to um, either lock people up or issue a warrant, other things like that. Uh, individuals not provided legal counsel or notified of rights. And that's something that a lot of people have touched upon and something we heard time and time again was that for a lot of people, their only interaction with their local government was in the municipal court system. And when they entered it, they saw a judge that was paid by the municipality and a prosecutor that was paid by the municipality and no one that was there to even inform them of their basic rights. 
Um, and that was one of the issues that really came about quite often. So some of the, when we discussed, you know, with experts, with individuals who had gone through the system, attorneys, what are some of the best practices and some potential reforms? We wanted to find out some basic ways we could address these things. Uh, we think that it begins with granting greater oversight, uh, a system that requires, um, you know, paperwork to be turned in, but it isn't monitored. Uh, there's no enforcement of it. Uh, simply doesn't do the trick. Implementing a 10% cap on the amount of general revenue, um, the Senator Schmidt's bill uh, that he has issued would do. Uh, another was pooling municipal court fines and fees. Um, you know, in the previous presentation, there was a discussion about that system. Um, with the courts, though, it really takes away a, a direct incentive to fine uh, your own citizens or those passing through your jurisdiction. And unlike with sales tax revenue, a fine, if I issue it as a municipality, I get to keep all of that. So what you have is a very powerful tool for accumulating revenue in your municipality. Um, ensuring a court's ability to remain open to the public. As we've heard, we also heard um, similar stories of people that weren't allowed to bring children in. And when we went to discuss why that was happening, again, it was, we have too big of a docket. So they just simply couldn't accommodate the amount of people that they were bringing in um, to find me. Uh, just a few more bullet points. Providing a uniform list of rights and procedural options. A lot of the people that we just, uh, met with and spoke to really felt the deck was stacked against them. They didn't know their rights. They weren't plainly issued to them. If you go to court and you request this, this has to happen. Um, you know, whether that's placed at the entrance of the courts on municipal websites, we thought that it could be on the back of every citation so that immediately it doesn't create an us against you mentality. You know, here's your rights, we're making you aware of them. Requiring courts to utilize alternative means, that was previously discussed, providing for ability to pay hearings. Requiring that municipal judges be selected by a panel in the judicial circuit in which they sit. Currently, they can be hired in some places, the prosecutors, judges, by the municipality. Um, and when 30% of the operating revenue for that municipality comes from the courts, I think that, you know, I would know what was expected of me. Um, that's not to say that all judges do that. All judges are put in that circumstance. But it's one of the things that we can't ha have a justice system that we just have to say to people, oh, trust us, it's on the level. Um, because it's just not happening. And finally, requiring a municipal court to have a paid public defender. Um, on average, the municipal courts, we found that every municipal court on average brings in a half million more dollars than it spends to operate. Um, that's certainly um, a significant chunk of money that could be utilized to have um, public defenders there. Um, those are all of our suggestions, so thank you. David, thank you. Could I ask all of our panel to, if you could all go, David, stay up there. If all could kind of array yourself behind the podium, because I think we're going to have questions, and one or more of you may want to respond to them, because uh, this has raised a number of issues, and the members of the community had lots of questions that they raised in the breakout sessions, and so I wrote a number of them down. We're going to try to represent them. So let's uh, start with uh, questions from commissioners, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll ask you to help us here, please. Microphones behind you down here and down here. Uh, David, can I just clarify one thing? Did you say, and TR, this is a little bit putting these two things together, taxes paid by citizens in the county were shared, but fines are, are kept, which is the $45 million, are kept in the municipalities, which creates an incentive to fine because you're in control of that versus the shared model. Did I get that right? Sorry. The uh, sales tax pool involves sales tax sharing across the, the municipalities based on um, categories and probably takes much more time than I think a seminar class could be dedicated to. But with the court system, what you have is a direct incentive. Um, so if I find someone a dollar, I keep a dollar. Okay. So with the 90 municipalities, just 
do you have a spreadsheet of these municipalities? Who's up 30%? Who's this? I mean, all these questions that I have in a simple spreadsheet. Correct. And we do have that. We have um, reports for all the commissioners uh, located on the table behind you with a table of all that information. Um, what we did was that information is provided to the state, um, but we put it in a table that, where you can see the revenue that's brought in, their general budget for the year, and things like that. But all of that is in there. And we'll post that on the website. I have a question, a uh, question about civil uh, proceedings that the municipal court should be civil proceedings who I'm not sure as it may. But yeah, yeah. Sure. Would you kind of elaborate on the fact that municipal court proceedings are in fact civil proceedings and not criminal proceedings when uh, the foundation for that and right. what that means again? Right. Well, um, numerous cases out of the Court of Appeals and the Missouri Supreme Court have specifically referred to our courts in the municipalities as civil. Uh, Kansas v. Martin, uh, Frisch versus City of Columbia, Kansas City versus Myers. These go back over time and they repeatedly say that these are civil proceedings. Now I will say, you know, it's not a neat, some constitutional issues and claims are neater than others. This isn't as neat as it might be. Uh, but when you have these declarations that they are civil proceedings by our court system and then you have um, inconsistent provisions within the, the, the rules uh, promulgated by the courts or uh, statutory provisions, I think there's an argument that those are unconstitutional. Um, there's also a United States Supreme Court case, Atwater, Atwater versus Lago Vista from 2001, that looked at the issue of arrests for minor crimes, right? If it's a crime and it's a clear misdemeanor, uh, officers are permitted to make arrests. There were some question about low-level offenses and could they be arrestable. And so here, I think if they are civil offenses, if we repeatedly have heard that and we're told that you have fewer rights because they are civil and there's a whole list of things that go along with them being civil and informal, that there's a, a potential Fourth Amendment violation every time there's an arrest for one of these uh, uh, claims. And then the jail, the bail and jail process, to me, amounts to a, a civil uh, deprivation of liberty. We don't do that in the United States. Uh, can I ask you a question based on that, too? Yeah. Um, so you're talking about an arrest for an infraction as opposed to an arrest for a misdemeanor. Right. And and has that been tested in the Missouri Supreme Court? Uh, I do not know if it has. The... Um, even if it had been tested in the Missouri Supreme Court, one of the interesting things I have found having come to the state, people give up really easily. They get really beaten down by our systems. And their notion of what's okay is based on local practice or even just Missouri practice. But there are federal courts and there's the federal constitution. And I do wonder if someone went in and sought an injunction in our federal court system for one of these kiddo protesters who had bail set on them, if they might not prevail in a challenge, and that being an improper deprivation of liberty in a civil court system. Thank you, and then David, I've got a couple questions sure. for you. Um, you said the next uh, comparable or county, I assume that was Jackson County that you looked at compared to? It was not, it was a uh, county just south of Jackson. I think Jackson has- uh, Cass eight, County, probably. Yeah, 18 municipal courts in Jackson. So Jackson only has 18 and mm -hmm. Cass has more than that. Mm -hmm. And then you, you may not be able to answer this question, but do you have any idea how Senator Schmidt came up with 10%? I think that um, there's been a lot of discussions that, you know, we've had people come and the 10% number is a number that over half of the municipalities in the St. Louis region already operate under. Um, so I think that, you know, if in a lot of the discussions that we've been a part of, it's come up as a cap that would allow for municipalities to operate in a healthy way, um, just based on the fact that an overwhelming majority of municipalities are already below it. Okay, so that that's that'll be included. That's included in the information you have. Yes, for us. that is in the report as well. Okay, and then uh, I guess the state auditor is doing an audit of a lot of these courts. And from my understanding, is part of the problem is definitions um, on what is general revenue, and 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 I think that kind of has to be clarified also because you can kind of skew the numbers. Uh, a little bit either way. We um, largely got the general revenue numbers from how a municipality defined general revenue in their budgets and also from the state documents. So we try to stay pretty consistent with it, um, but you know, there are a few municipalities where we got it from one source or the other. Thank you.
Can, can I follow up on that real quick? Just want to say, um, as far as the 10% number, I, th I think Ferguson, we, 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 in our paper, we said that they made 20% of their revenue from the courts, which they've corrected and said it's 11%. Regardless of what the percentage is, it's $2.7 million, right? It's, all, it's, it's too much. Um, and people feel that, that it's too much. So at $2.7 million, it's still, if I operated a business and my costs were four hundred dollars or $500,000 to run the court, and $2.2 .2 million in profit, that's a healthy business. And I think there's some perverse incentives there, even at, even at 11%, which is what they say it is. Commissioner Packnett. So, so two questions, and this might be answered by, by Dave or Thomas. Um, I was interested to see what I did not know previously was that the excess amount of money was supposed to be going to schools, and there is nothing that makes me more frustrated than our children not getting the resources that are owed to them. And so I wonder what you know about if any of that excess money is actually getting to them, and if so, what kind of proportion comparative to what it is supposed to be? So we asked the state for any instances where the excess revenue had been reported and a check had been sent. Um, and the way that it's sent is set is for anything over 30% to go to the schools. So if you have 50%, the extra 20% goes to the schools in your county. Um, they had shared with us that it had happened once, um, but it was on the western side of the state um, from a very, very small town. Um, but there was no instances they had recorded from the St. Louis area. And how long has that law been on the books? Uh, I know that it was just changed um, over the course of the past year and a half, so it's probably about that long. But before mm -hmm. that, in some um, form, Thomas, do you know? Years before that, though, as well. But yeah. You said 1997. And, yeah, it's been modified since. Okay, thank you. And my, my other question is for uh, Professor Quinn. Um, given that education was, I guess, the third most important topic that folks in the uh, first uh, voting wanted to talk about. Um, and just for the sake of the conversation that is coming, I would like for you to connect the dots a little bit for people, um, given what you implied talking about the necessity of us talking about discipline practices, et cetera, in schools. So if you've got the kind of young man that you talked about being held for 14 hours, no explanation, then getting dropped back off into his neighborhood like nothing ever happened. No, he's got let out the front door with no money to get home. Thank you for that correction, an important <laughs> Sorry. one. No, 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 that's an important <laughs> correction. Do not apologize. So then what are our children carrying with them into school when those kinds of things are happening to them? Yeah, I mean, I think you've, you've hit it on, our, on the head. I mean. Only in recent years, I think, have we paid enough attention to trauma and its impact uh, on young people and trauma-informed practices then being used in our courts. Instead, what we have in the municipal court system is a trauma-imposing system. It is, it is not at all concerned with uh, harm reduction or the like to these young people. And absolutely, I think the kids go into school, they talk to their teachers about these issues. I've had teachers call me in the city saying, 17-year-old's been picked up, I don't know where he is, and the two of us hopped in my car and went to go look for this kid. Uh, it, they're out of school. Um, there are issues of education and educational services for young people while they're incarcerated. I mean, I, have, I don't want to overstate it, right, because um, the cap in municipal court is 90 days in jail, and I haven't had kids in for many, many, many days, but enough that they've missed school and they're behind, and they're surely not getting those services while in our, while in our local jails. In fact, across the state, it's a somewhat separate issue, but young people who are charged uh, as adults, if they're sitting in our jails, they will get no educational services for weeks, months, and sometimes years until they are sent to state prison. Thank you. Can, can I, can yeah. I, sorry. Yeah. I just want to say something that's, it's, um, it's not directly impacting the children, but the way we've seen in the representation of homeless folks is, um, at some point on their path to homelessness, many of them are arrested on one of these warrants and held in, in jail, they end up losing their housing, which of course loses the housing for children as well, right? So in the middle of an academic year, they're trying to change school districts, which we all know disrupts their education and has a direct impact on it. So it's not always the case that, that you know, these, these courts, these courts are a factor in the creation of homelessness, but certainly that disruption, if people lose their housing, is going to destroy people's educational opportunities as well. Thank you very much for making sure that's represented. Um, thank you. I have a question. You said that for municipalities that are out of compliance and, mis and municipalities that haven't reported, that there's a process in place to dismantle it 
and unauthorized, how does that work? What, what needs to happen to say this municipal court can no longer function this way or at all? So when they d fail to report um, is when the municipal courts um, lose their jurisdiction under the law. When they go over 30%, if they still report it to the state, they technically r retain their jurisdiction is our understanding. But what they fail to do is provide that excess money to the schools, which could also help have them lose jurisdiction. So it's supposed to be, according to the law as plainly read, automatic. Um, so the courts should lose jurisdiction when they fail to timely report. Okay, so if the court fails to report, there's an automatic provision that they lose it, jurisdiction? What is stated is that they lose jurisdiction of their court. That right. simply. Let's make it more clear, David. Who has enforcement authority for yeah, that provision? Yeah, who well, enforces that? Well, from what we've seen, no one. Um, so let me, so I'm, I unfairly asked you that question. I should have asked one of the lawyers here. Well. Uh, you are a lawyer? Yes, but what. what <laughs> I'm, not, and I'm, not, I'm not asking, so I'm being clear. I'm not asking you who's doing it. Right. I'm asking you who has authority to do it. Well. Technically, the state has the authority to do it. It's a state law. Who in the state has the authority to do it? That seems to be something that not only I'm confused about, but the state is as well. We haven't seen any it actually happen, so we don't know who would do it. Do you others have? Uh, well, I mean, so we we have a lawsuit filed against one of the municipalities right now, testing that exact question. So, our, so our, we allege that they lost jurisdiction under the theory that that Dave's talking about, and that as a result. They operated a court where there was a guy standing in front of the courtroom saying he was a judge, but he wasn't really a judge um, because they had lost their jurisdiction over traffic-related matters. So we're going to find out what the circuit court has to say about that um, at some time in the future. But right now, we, we, I could, we couldn't figure out what the mechanism is to enforce it. So bringing a, a lawsuit against municipalities who have failed to report was the first step we took. So we filed against one municipality, and we'll see what the court has to say and then go from there. Can I ask a question about if they lose jurisdiction, does it transfer to the county? Where, where does it go? It, I mean, it that, that could, but the, the statute just says, I mean, it's the most, it's among the strongest language you can ever see in a statute. It says, shall immediately um, what, lose jurisdiction over traffic related matters in the municipal court. So I guess we're going to find out what it, what it exactly means. Oh, I mean, they could always have these cases handled in the in the associate circuit court. That that's that's something that they that all of the municipalities could elect to do. They could create uh, regional courts. They could create four regional courts. They have a broad amount of latitude to solve these problems on their own. Um, it's just that you know, as Professor Quinn said, <laughs> Professor Lauer wrote that article 50 years ago. It's not like people didn't know about this. It's been going on for a long time. So. So let me pursue this just a little bit further because this, you know, the, to have municipalities violating a law that is on its face as clear as it is, is appalling, right? So uh, pushing further on who can enforce this, do, does the Supreme Court have the authority of making rules for the courts in the state? Would any prosecutor have the authority to bring an action? Would the state attorney general? have the authority to bring an action. Last week, uh, Starsky and I issued a statement at the end of the meeting. Based upon data, some of the data that you provided, David, that these municipalities were over 30% and should immediately cease these practices. So we, we want to nail down who's potentially got the authority here and how do we push them to take the action they need to take. Well, so the agencies that are involved in this process, and this is, um, is direct and answer as I know how to give, um, because it's just not a process we've seen, is the uh, Director of Revenue, because they're supposed to be receiving the funds. Um, the State Auditor, because the, the financials are supposed to be reported to them every year. Um, I would imagine that the Attorney General does have authority to file a suit on behalf of um, some of the people. But those are the three that I know um, have been the main focus. So 
I mean, some of what you're pointing out, out is just this problem of these claims laying on the backs of individual plaintiffs, many of whom barely have enough money to operate their own <laughs> uh, shops. And I, I haven't spent as much time with this statutory scheme as these guys have, but I would, I would think the AG would be equally well suited to be able to pursue this kind of claim if so desired. And this commission, I think, could recommend the ability of uh, state level officials to have greater oversight and policing powers in the days ahead as to municipal courts, as to juvenile justice practices. I mean, we don't seem to have the kind of oversight agencies in this state that you see in the federal executive branch uh, and that you see in a lot of other states, like an ombuds office or other kinds of agencies that could be watching so, this and then bring claims. So I don't mean to belabor this, but in, in Missouri, the Supreme Court makes the rules for the court system in Missouri. So why does the Supreme Court not have the authority to make rules that have uh, have ability to stick in municipal courts as well as circuit courts? Of course they do. Yes, they do. Oh, they do. Uh, of course they do. Right, but then who enforces it, right? So it's my it's my 16-year-old client who's then forced to try to bring right. a claim on my $5,000 clinic budget and the yeah. students leaving for yeah. summer. But yeah. but the the, the I, kind like, of litigation look, you're look, providing. I, I, guess the, I guess the point is, if if the people in the state were going to do something about it, they would have already done it, right? right? I mean, yeah, like, like there's a reason we're here, and in part, it's because this stuff's been going on for a long time, and and there's not, it's not, it is very unlikely. The actions you're talking about are very unlikely to come from people who are in power and benefit from the system the way it is. It's not like the system's broken. It works how it's supposed to work. Okay. I mean. So we'll continue, we'll continue the questions from the commissioners, but I'm, I'll reinforce, and now we've got a little, we have a narrowed, um, excuse the language, narrowed targets uh, on this statement. Um, but what we called for last week and what we invited, and I say this interestingly enough, between Monday's meeting last week and Monday's meeting this week, um, our city defenders and others filed this action, or we saw no notice of this action around municipal courts, fines, and fees. Um, so with thanks for that action, we'll renew the call. Amen. <laughs> with thanks for that action, I'm just going to specify the statement we asked for last week. Uh, we invited any state authority, any state officials with authority to act uh, in this space around municipal courts, fines and fees, particularly where we know there is excess and we know there are at least eight municipalities to do so, we now know that perhaps it is the Director of Revenue, perhaps it is the State Auditor, perhaps it's the Attorney General. So now we'll just say, whomever in these three offices <laughs> has the authority to act, we invite you to act on behalf of the people and not, I'll just leave it there. So we'll invite whatever offices have authority to act as our city defenders has acted already um, to enforce the law that is on the books specifically as it relates to those municipalities who are already above the 30%. I have a question. I'd like to I, ask. I just want to say, I want to say, sorry, one other quick thing. And I only say this to call attention to just how widespread some of the unlawful practices are. The, the seven lawsuits that we filed with SLU Law and, and Campbell Law Office don't have anything to do with the statute you just talked about. It's another separate unlawful practice of charging fees that are not authorized by state law. That's what we allege. Again, a court will find that out. But that's what we allege. I, I mean, there's litigation go on for 10 years around the things that, that have been going on here. And the other thing, with Dave, you should say this. One of the other things that we've looked at and was discussed was also the potential for a school district who maybe should have benefited from some of that excess revenue coming forward um, and challenging that as well. I've got a quick question I wanted to ask to the law professor at Washington University. I'm interested. Hi, I'm sorry. Your name? Please call me May. May. Uh, recommendation number nine for you in the short term was grant amnesty right now, exclamation point. How feasible is that? How practically could that be done? How can we help to recommend that that happen? Well, I wrote to the mayor of Ferguson twice uh, in conjunction with various youth advocates around the community asking for that at least to occur in Ferguson. I got no, res well, first I wasn't permitted to testify because we ran out of time, but I got no response to that letter. I think it's very feasible. I think, you know, there are uh, amnesty programs that take place around the county that are not real amnesty programs all the time that charge people money. I don't, I don't know where that money is going, frankly. Uh, but 
I see no reason why it couldn't happen right now, especially when I said in my letter, it's not only the right thing to do, it's the legally expedient thing to do in light of the past deprivations and legal claims that potentially lie for young people who've had all these pleas taken from them with no lawyers, not intelligently, knowingly, or voluntarily. Okay, thank you. Uh, May, I have another, uh, or anyone, uh, to grant amnesty. Do you all have any idea what the ballpark is on that number right now? How much money are we talking about? I don't know what the number is, but I mean, as I, the last numbers we saw, there were four, 411,000 outstanding warrants in St. Louis County for a town of just under a million people. So I don't know wow. what cases, um, you know, are attached to all those warrants, but it, it'd be a big number. <laughs> all right. I, and then the, um, the last thing I think to Starsky and Rich, I mean, I know we just called for leaders, auditors, director of revenue, AG, does that mean we're drafting a letter and sending it to them, or is that minutes worth? I mean, tell me how we go from that to I, I something think, in there. I, th I think if, if what I'm hearing is a sense of the commission that we need to beef, last time, last week it was a statement of the co-chairs, now we're going to beef it up, and I think we follow it with some pretty strong phone calls uh, and push from different commission members and others in the community that we asked for because this is, I, I think, I, I hear your point, Thomas, if this, uh, you know, this should have been done years and years ago, it hasn't been done, why isn't it being done? We need to call for action much more stringently. Are there any other commis uh, commissioners have a question? Tracy. I have a question for uh, you and Starsky. Is it possible for us to request to have them at our next meeting on Monday? Is that possible? Uh, we're, we're not meeting on Monday, but it is certainly possible. The next for us, meeting yeah, that we it meet, is, certainly is possible it possible that we issue a personal invitation requesting that they come and meet with us in this setting? Certainly. Absolutely. Thank you, Rose, and then Felicia. I just have one more question, May, for you. So two bills were mentioned. They're both Senate bills. Uh, Wallingford's bill, with, which deals with the age of juveniles, the definitional age, and the second one is Eric Schmidt's bill. So knowing what I know about how long it takes to pass legislation at the state level, I'm, I'm fully appreciative and supportive of those bills, but is there anything we can do locally <laughs> to change any of these policies Municipal wide yeah, across so, all municipalities. So right now, for instance, a very simple measure, right? In conjunction with the municipal councils, the municipal police departments could engage in better practices around policing youth, and they could have a practice of every first encounter is a warning. Every young person who is encountered on the train without fare is put off the train and not prosecuted. We, as as you know, <laughs> we met with. Um, Metro officials months ago about this, my students and I, and talked with them about the problem. I will say, they said they didn't know the extent of the problem of young people being prosecuted in the warrants. I refer to the kids as kids living under the bridge. They hide out with multiple warrants just for $2 train fare warrants. And uh, they were not willing at that time to agree not to prosecute, but to consider possible further conversations. I repeatedly reached out after that with no response. And then Michael Brown was shot. There was things that did not continue. The Thank conversation you. didn't continue. Thank you. Felicia. Um, in terms of losing jurisdiction over your municipal court, I'm out of compliance. One of these people that we've identified as possibly having authority to enforce the law enforces the law. Do I just reestablish a court under a different, uh, you know, some different municipal legislation? Or what, what does that look like? I want my court back. What does that look like? So the law actually doesn't provide any sort of um, situation for that to happen. Um, that's not to say it couldn't happen. And again, we're kind of dealing with the situation that we haven't even gotten to the enforcement part yet. So there's no examples to look at either. Um, it's certainly something that could use some clarity because I would suspect that if you just take jurisdiction away from a day, that's probably not going to be too large of a deterrent. Um, but as for the specifics on that, it's unclear for the statute. Okay, so you just, you just want to ensure that 
we would want to assure that something like that is addressed while we're moving into enforcement, some of the what ifs. Okay. I, th I, think, I think it's, I think they reestablish jurisdiction once they file the report. Uh, and it's, I also want to be clear that they don't, it's, it's written in a way that suggests that they would only lose jurisdiction over traffic related matters, not housing code violations and things like that. So they don't cease to operate as a court, but, but again, it, it does, it's, it's not clear what that would actually mean. You'd be a judge on a housing code violation, but not on a speeding ticket. It's, it's, it's really not exactly clear. That's our, that's our position is that they would have lost their jurisdiction to, to impose fines and make decisions on traffic-related matters during the period when they had failed to file the report. And, but yet they still forfeit the money under the law, correct? Well, that's what we would ask them yeah. to do is return the money to the people that they took it from. Can Gabe? I ask you a question? Can I ask one more question? Uh, if these municipal, municipal courts lose jurisdiction, does that mean that every case they've prosecuted since they should not have been prosecuting would then be discarded. I mean, that's what the judge is going to tell us. That's, that's, I mean, that's one of the things we have yet to find out, but under our theory, they didn't have the authority to bring that case. Um, that the court didn't have authority to act. Now, they can always, they can always just refile the charges. It's not like it, it doesn't end those charges. They want to go through that process. Um, they, they have some options, but it's unclear. So let me, I'm unclear, so let me ask it this way. I'm saying to you, if the municipal court lost its authority to act in traffic cases, and you could pinpoint the day that they lost that because of the way the law is written, if the law says if they're noncompliant, then they immediately lose it. If they were noncompliant two years ago, does that mean that every case since that time is invalid? Again, yeah, that's that's what we believe. That's what our that's what our lawsuit says. I, I'm I'm sorry. There's no way to know because the it's a new law. It hasn't been tested. No one's ever tried to enforce it. Our position is. They, they was, it was not valid for them to enforce the law in that court at that time as soon as they filed, failed to file their paperwork. Thank you. Uh, last question, uh, Gabe, and then uh, Starsky will, will do a, a wrap-up on this issue for us. Hey, um, <clears throat> a couple quick questions. Um, Mr. Harvey, uh, you talked a little bit about a, um, a program you said that was in place in Alabama. Uh, where, where, where in Alabama was that? Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery, Alabama. So is the upshot... Known for its liberal treatment of poor people. <laughs> so, so, so the upshot of the system that's been put in place there is that it's a system under which no one will ever spend time in jail simply because they can't pay the fine. Absolutely. And that's uh, how it should be. Right. 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 I mean, it, it should already be that way under the law in the state of Missouri. Right, but that's something, I mean, you, you can have a regime set up, even if you were gonna continue the enforcement exactly the way it was, you could have a regime set up whereby um, that's never a valid basis for holding someone in jail. Exactly. Um, and then Mr. Leofoltz, a uh, question for you. When you went through your recommendations, one you had in there is this idea of pooling um, revenue from fines rather than letting the municipality keep it. Correct. Um, when, um, when, when TR was speaking earlier, he was saying that the, the system of pooling sales revenue is something that people are finding unworkable now. And one thing that occurred to me is the one, the one problem with those pooling circumstances is you have the, you're providing resources to maybe uh, municipalities that don't really have the economic resources to survive, which might suggest they may be municipalities that shouldn't survive. And so if we, if we start pooling that revenue, are we just going to perpetuate this system of, of some municipalities out there that... Those municipalities are already taking 60% of their revenue from fines and fees. The ones that need it to survive are taking it. Um, what I think pooling it would do is create distance between a direct incentive of fine $5, keep $5, and 
other municipalities that aren't fining in that way for the revenue is going to bring the amount that a municipality could possibly bring in down. But isn't isn't capping it a more direct and better way to accomplish um, that? That would be fine too. I mean, a ten percent cap. Yes, um, but I think when it comes to the sales tax, we want to encourage economic development. I don't think you know we want to encourage um, you know fining and um, have that incentive there. So that's how we kind of arrived at them being different. And again, our list of recommendations really comes from months of meetings with individuals, people who work in the system as well. There's no real um, magic bullet that we offer that we think solves everything. These are the uh, comments and suggestions we got from experts in the community. And, and let me ask you this, in your um, research, which I haven't had a chance to look at yet, um, did you find, did you, did you look into at all did you, did you attempt to find any direct instances where, where this was, where the fines um, were clearly being driven by a desire to hit a certain revenue number? Is that something you looked at? No, but what we, we couldn't get to that detail of a level, but what we did find is we looked at several municipalities from 2008 on, and what we saw was a correlation between a decline in property tax revenue and an increase and municipal court fine and fee revenue. So, and you know, it wasn't our belief that the economic downturn made people speed more, so we thought that it was probably <laughs> more of a factor that municipalities were trying to find ways to survive and provide the same level of services at a time when most people couldn't do the exact same thing. And well, we want to thank you. Sorry, we're going to just wrap because I know we have some um, some administrative things we want to do as well. Uh, so we want to um, transition with our thanks to May, to Thomas, and to David. So, I'm sorry. I started with Professor Quinn. See, Thomas, is, he started paying attention when he heard his own name. <laughs> So no, we, we give thanks here. Um, we are pleased to see and to, to hear, quite frankly, uh, some of the redundancies and recommendations on reforms from our small group to uh, our speak out earlier um, to uh, the presentations of our speakers. We also give thanks, of course, to Commissioner Carr uh, for giving us some perspective and context on this. We recognize that there are other perspectives on some of these reforms. There's already dialogue going on in the Municipal League about potential reforms and uh, with folks uh, showing leadership like Judge Vatterod. So one of the things that we've done uh, is we've asked uh, Commissioner Carr and Commissioner Blackman uh, to co-chair a working group around municipal court reform. Uh, so that we continue to engage this conversation, taking in some of the recommendations that we've already heard, taking in the perspective that we've heard tonight, and recognizing um, the context that we live in where there's already some pre-filed legislation on this. This is something where we'll need some uh, feedback quickly. We'll need to weigh into the discussion um, uh, in, a, in an organized and, system, and systematic way as a commission uh, to be reflective and responsive of that which you have already offered. So uh, we will uh, post, as we have with other work group meetings, uh, the, uh, the work group um, um, progression uh, from C Commissioner Carr and Commissioner Blackman uh, as they lead that group and invite uh, ongoing participation and dialogue in that as well. With those things being said, we have a few administrative matters to transition to. I want to invite um, uh, my co-chair, Rich McClure, to lead us through those things. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, uh, we have two resolutions which have been provided to you uh, and um, uh, we need to act on them. The first is the Sunshine Policy that was recommended by uh, the Assistant Attorney General at our first meeting which was sent to you via email and is posted. Uh, this is the model policy copied exactly from uh, the manual which was provided to us and uh, establishes our custodian of records. So I need a motion to approve that policy. Mr. Black and a second, second here from Becky. And uh, so, is there any discussion or questions? Okay, hearing none, I would call all those in favor. Please say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right, the motion is passed. And we have a second uh, resolution which has been provided to you. I will read it uh, for the benefit of the audience since uh, the first one was discussed at our first meeting. Uh, this is a motion that I would ask uh, someone to make that the Ferguson Commission co-chairs be delegated the authority to take the following action in furtherance of continuing the initial work of the commission. 
One, to enter into vendor and consulting agreements to carry out the work of the commission, provided that the approval of both co-chairs is required, and provided that the agreements are consistent with the fiscal agent procedures established by the United Way as our fiscal agent. Secondly, that the co-chairs are authorized to establish procedures for the managing director of the commission uh, once on board to enter into vendor and consulting agreements on behalf of the commission where the total funds obligated are less than $10,000 and are included in the budget approved by the commission. And I would say again, consistent with the approval procedures by the United Way. And then finally provided that the co-chairs and the managing director will present the commission budget for approval at the next commission meeting. So I'd ask if anyone would be willing to make that motion. So move, second. Second from Rose. Questions or discussion from members of the commission? Okay, hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. And those opposed, please say no. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, just wrap us up here and say a couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, thank you all for staying. We have gone uh, over time, uh, but it has been most useful and productive, and you all have done that. I'm sorry, you had a clarification, and I told you you could make that clarification. My apologies. Thank you. I made a mistake when I spoke earlier. Ruth Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. Uh, I had said Emerson Electric had built a new facility, $60 million facility, and no property tax was to be paid. Actually, that was a mistake. It was Express Scripts. I am sorry to Emerson Electric. I made a commissioner slide, pointed it out to me, and uh, if you could please note that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making that correction. Thank you all for staying, for your vigorous participation in the evening in the community groups. We got great questions. I think you sense um, what we sense, and, and that is the great sense of urgency behind this issue. You all ranked it uh, as second, uh, and that's why we had this issue tonight, citizen law enforcement relations last week. We now have working groups who are charged with coming back to us and reporting as early as January on these so that legislative action can be called for and influence, since both will likely uh, be issues, or will clearly be issues in the legislature. There are bills being filed. Let me say this, we have, Starsky and I have already been in contact with legislative leaders. We've met with them multiple times in several cases. We've met with the sponsor of the municipal court bill. Uh, we intend, and we've met with state officials uh, on this very issue of enforcement that we've talked about tonight. So on behalf of you, and behalf of the feeling from the commissioners, it is our intent to be very active and to be very vigorous in this process. Yes, sir, quickly, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir, would you provide your name to the court reporter here, please, or to the transcriber? Richards. Leonard Richards. Thank you very much. She's just transcribing. it. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Can I ask that we all stand and uh, following a practice that uh, Reverend Wilson led us in uh, last time, we're going to, to take a moment just to center ourselves and to be quiet. We're on a campus whose motto is to have a higher purpose for a greater good uh, and uh, re- renewing our vow to be about higher purpose and greater good. Uh, I would ask that you center yourself in your faith, if appropriate, or just in a matter of silence to think about the things and the work before us in seeking justice.
Thank you. We have not yet established the date for our next meeting. We're going to have these working group meetings that will be posted on the website, but very early in January we'll be meeting. The topic will most likely be youth and education, uh, and uh, we look forward to your continued participation. Thank you. Uh, stlpositivechange.org. stlpositivechange.org.